is that as you look at your research papers, uh, Dr. Matchek will be here tonight, Dr. Ebeling uh, will be here uh, until uh, late tonight, early tomorrow morning, depending on his schedule. But I hope you are now beginning to look very closely at research paper subject matters that relate the course two topics with the, with the Freedom Seminar. And as you look at sources or, or topics for information, that the uh, rich four states book, that they're all gone. And, uh, Wait. Okay. Well, it, 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 let's, let's just. Uh, oh, there we go. So, in, in terms of subject matter or materials, please don't hesitate to, to ask Dr. Ebling or myself. Uh, I'll be here until tomorrow morning. I won't be here all day tomorrow, but um, uh, just make certain that if you have uh, questions or, info or you know, you're looking for subject matters. Uh, uh, to consider for your research papers that we can help you out. Today I think uh, this, uh, my last presentation is going to be on uh, issues related to uh, the size and scope of government, looking at spending, looking at uh, taxes, and, and uh, looking at how government finances activities. And so I hope there'll, there'll be a, a number of um, potential suggestions for you that come, come out of uh, this uh, talk. As you look at, uh, first and foremost, the global economy, what I want to do is have you look at the global economy, the U.S. economy, and the, the Michigan state economy, and, and hopefully I'll give you uh, uh, some good information and spur some thinking as it relates to just, A, how you can make a difference uh, in the global economy, the, the U.S. economy, the state economy, for those of you that aren't U.S. citizens in your home country, but also look at uh, what, it, what it means in terms of um, making a difference in, with regard to, in some cases, the last class that you have before you earn your degree. So as you look at uh, uh, the, the world economy, there's a good book. I agree with a lot of it. I disagree with a lot of it. But there's a book by a fellow named Tom Friedman called The World is Flat. It's been out for probably four or five years now. But I would encourage you to read it because uh, Tom Friedman does a very nice job in pointing out that uh, with the onset of increased economic freedom, which I would trace back to the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and uh, uh, the freedom movement in China, there is a tremendous amount of information flow that didn't exist before increased political and economic freedom and before technology such as the World Wide Web. So when Friedman says the world is flat, what he's saying is these barriers to entry that could have been just the inability for, uh, to have the freedom of movement. You know, when Jonathan said people vote with their feet, well, not all people are allowed to vote with their feet. There are a lot of people that would have left the old Soviet Union had they been able to leave. I remember listening to Milton Friedman one time talk about the Berlin Wall. And he said, uh, you know, if, if you really understand the Berlin Wall, the East Germans didn't put up the Berlin Wall to keep the West Germans out of East Germany. China put up the, the Great Wall in China to keep the Mongols out of what we call mainland China today. The reason why the East Germans put up the Berlin Wall was because they were afraid under their communist system all the productive people would have left East Germany and traveled to, to West Germany. So w one of the things that I think is important is we're, we're very privileged to be able to vote with our feet. And if we don't like something, as Jonathan noted, in one state, we can leave and go to another state. Or if we don't like what's going on in a country, we can leave and go to another country if we live in a free country. 
So in some ways the world is freer today, in some ways the world is less free today, but certainly in terms of the freedom of movement, it, it is freer today than it's been uh, in, in, in a long, long time. As you look at uh, uh, economic cycles and human progress, this is something that uh, Mike Cox, our speaker on Thursday night, and I put together. And it is, it is really something that I think explains really where we are as a free society. And it's really truly what has made the United States and many Western countries the, the great economies and the great societies that they have been. And, and that is that we, we understand the role of the entrepreneur, the role of the intrapreneur. We understand their role and their function in a free society. And, and these are the men and women that go out there and they take risks. And they come up with ideas. And, and a lot of us are great idea people. I always say to, to my wife, I say, Pam, I'm an idea man. But the problem with being an idea person and not being an entrepreneur or not being an entrepreneur is that a lot of us have these great ideas, but are we willing to take the risks that entrepreneurs take to bring these ideas to fruition? You know, oftentimes the entrepreneur fails four, five, six times before uh, she or he makes it into a successful business. Uh, those of you that are entrepreneurship majors know that uh, on a regular basis, nine out of ten businesses fail. If you work in the corporate environment, nine out of ten inventions that a company like Dow Chemical is working on in the lab never make it to the marketplace. If you look at uh, family-owned businesses, if you happen to be a family-owned business that makes it to the third generation, you're in the top 5%. Only 5% of family-owned businesses ever make it to the third generation. A little over 1% make it to the fourth generation. And less than a half percent of family-owned businesses ever make it to ownership at a fifth generation level. So it's not easy being a business person. And the point is, in a truly free economy, and for the most part in the United States, nobody's there to say to you, you just lost the family fortune. Or, boy, why, you know, a lot of people will say, why'd that idiot mortgage his house? Why'd they take out a second mortgage to start that business? Nobody's there when you fail. But unfortunately, the envy society that we have in the United States today, we have a lot of people that will line up and say, well, those, you know, business people should be paying more in taxes. Why are they only paying 30%? Or why are they only paying 40%? We forget about the entrepreneurial risk and we forget about the fact that these are people that create the vast majority of jobs in this country. It is the small business that eventually becomes the, the large business. We forget about the fact that it was about 115 years ago that H.H. H. Dow, this, this short, uh, small in stature, incredible mind, brilliant young chemist from then Case College, which is today Case Western University. Took everything he had, convinced a couple of other business people to back him, and at age 21 he left Cleveland, Ohio, and he came to the very wooded area of mid-Michigan because he heard there was brine in them hills. Now, there aren't many hills, and I still am looking for the Saginaw, the actual Saginaw Valley, but he, but he came to mid-Michigan because he thought he could take brine and process it into bromine and create a great chemical company. And little did he know that less than 115 years later, Dow Chemical would be the largest chemical company in the world. But another thing that you may not know, uh, gang, is that uh, for those of you that have studied on the Midland campus, which I think is most of you, if not all of you, after H.H. Dow started the Dow Chemical Company, and they were drilling for brine to make bromine, they discovered oil. And they kept coming up with this carbon-based fuel. It was, you know, it was a sludge, and it was getting in the way of mining for brine. And so uh, uh, Mr. Graves, who was uh, a Dow's geologist slash chemist, 
got together with some outside investors and said, hey, we own this land. We've got this carbon-based fuel called oil. We can't use it at this time in our chemical production process. Would you like to lease the land and extract oil? A couple of investors said, makes sense. And whether you realize it or not, by the early 1930s, Michigan was the number four, oil, number four oil producing state in the country, and the United States was the number one producer of oil in the world. The World Oil Congress met in Mount Pleasant, Michigan in 1934, I think it was. The Great Depression never hit Mount Pleasant. They never had negative GDP. Mount Pleasant was about 4,000 people in 1934, and 25,000 people came to Mount Pleasant for the first or second meeting of the World uh, Oil it was either Congress or ex, uh, Exhibition. I can't remember exactly the name. And in Michigan today, there are individuals. Uh, Keith Pretty and I met with the man who uh, produced uh, for 45 years the Michigan Oil and, and Natural Gas uh, 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 magazine. And he says that today Michigan probably has enough oil deposits to once again be the third or four, number three or number four producer of oil, bless you, in the state or in the country, but that regulations and taxes on drilling uh, make Michigan number 12 or 13 and declining. But Michigan has incredible known reserves of oil and even larger amounts of suspected reserves of oil, but we don't have a business-friendly state for that to happen. Now, all I, the only reason I bring that up as kind of a side note is that oftentimes in this entrepreneurial cycle, you'll see discoveries that they weren't looking for oil. Uh, Mr. Graves was, was drilling for Mr. Dow looking for brine. But the two biggest initial discoveries in Michigan were the Saginaw find between Midland and Saginaw County and what we call Oil City. Now, when you drive over to Mount Pleasant, you drive through Oil City and you say, Oil City, what, why is it Oil City? That was the largest area of oil production in the state of Michigan. Per square mile, there are more oil wells there than in any part of the state. And um, you know, a lot of that uh, ha has dried up, not because the oil isn't there, but it's because of the regulatory costs in Michigan to extract oil. So as, as you think about it, entrepreneurs sometimes uh, are, are, are very thoughtful and well-intended and, and direct in their discoveries. In other cases, it wasn't what they were looking for, but by accident, they discover things and create incredible opportunities and fortunes in the process. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite examples is that, you know, as a kid, I'm not sure how many of you, any of you ever play with Silly Putty? Remember Silly Putty? You know, Silly Putty was the invention of a, of a scientist at Dow Corning. And uh, he was, uh, uh, was living out on Sanford Lake, was a chemist, chem engineer. And they had this uh, product, and um, he brought it home because it was at that final stage. It was going to become one of the nine out of the ten inventions uh, that uh, wasn't going to make it to the market. And uh, he was ready to go in on Monday and tell his boss that I can't think of a good application for this. And he left it on the... Uh, the uh, kitchen table on a Saturday night, and he's up on uh, uh, Sunday morning, and his son comes in and asks if he can play with the, the, this mound of putty clay on the table. And, uh, you know, this guy was kind of thinking, well, would it be good? The scientist was thinking, would it be good for, you know, at, at the time you'd, you'd put, you had a wooden frame window, you put the glass in, and then, you, you know, you have the glazing. He was kind of thinking, well, maybe this could be a new glazing for windows. Well, you, you folks don't have to worry about that with the windows that we have today unless you live in an older house. And uh, he says, yeah, he knew that there was nothing in the chemical compound that could harm his kid. And uh, so the kid's in there playing with it. And, and about 10 minutes later, true story, the kid comes in. He says, daddy, daddy. And he had the Sunday comics. And he had, he had put the silly putty, or the putty, on the... Uh, um, Sunday funnies, and he brought in Dagwood uh, and Blondie 
uh, the, the color cartoon had been been uh, extracted from the, the ink had been extracted from the, the cartoon onto the putty. And uh, guy brought it in. Dow Corning says, geez, we, this is interesting. Your kid had a lot of fun with it. He saw he had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, you know, he was going around with books and, and uh, cartoons. And, and Dow Corning says, eh, this isn't our expertise. But they called another company and ended up selling it to Hasbro. And Hasbro put it in a little egg and called it Silly Putty. But this was, you know, literally how it happened. And so it's that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial process that, that it really, truly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is at its peak in a free society. Because in a free society, you're looking at angles that, that you never thought of. And in many cases, if you don't have a, a solution to the problem, you're encouraged to work in teams. You're encouraged to work with others. You're encouraged to say, well, maybe this doesn't work for us, but is there another company that we can sell this to? And so, in essence, what happens is you're always constantly looking to improve, to better. And it's, as, uh, as Michael Cox noted and Dr. Ebling noted, it's, it's really uh, the Nobel laureate Friedrich von Hayek's work, it's Joseph Schumpeter's work, and this whole notion of creative destruction. Uh, the marketplace is constantly saying, if you are not at your peak game, if you are not doing your best, the market process will replace you. Somebody is always constantly out there trying to, quote unquote, build a better mousetrap. And if you look at uh, things like, uh, as I mentioned uh, with my father yesterday, a handheld calculator from $300 in 1972 to a slightly better handheld calculator for $25 in 1976. And you look at it, uh, you know, how many times you get a little wallet and there's a built-in calculator and they give it to you for free. Those little calculators had more, have more processing power than calculators, big box calculators that banks used in the 1950s that they paid thousands of dollars for. And yet these little calculators in, in your wallets that they give as a throwaway item are more powerful and cost almost nothing today to produce and sell. Or you think about flat screen TVs in your lifetime. You know, probably 10 years ago, your family might have bought a flat screen TV. It's in a big box, weighs, you know, hundreds of pounds, and they might have paid eight or nine or $10,000. And today you can get the same size screen, mount it in many different ways, and get it for well under $1,500, and it's a better quality uh, a system. And so you look at it, that's the entrepreneurial process. That's creative destruction. That's individuals saying, if you don't do it better, we will. And it's what gives us the highest standard of living in the world today. It's that these entrepreneurs are out there constantly making a better mousetrap. One of your fellow students and I are working on an article right now and, and, and this, this is something that we're not quite done with, but just, just think about this along the lines of it, the improvements that have taken place in terms of uh, uh, the, the market process and, and this notion of creative destruction. Ford, Ford Motor produced the Model T in 1908. Do any of you have any idea how much the initial Model T cost in 1908? Anybody want to take a guess? 1908 and 1908 dollars. $1,300. Not bad. A little lower. You're close. Less than 11, more than 8. $950. Okay? And over time, with economies of scale and scope, uh, it, it actually reached a, a level during the lifetime of the uh, Model T of about $310 before they ended the Model T. But if you took that 1908 Model T and you said, how much would that 1908 Model T cost in 2010 dollars? Because the dollar buys a lot less today than it did in 1908. What do you think that Model T would cost today? How much? Lower. A little bit lower. <laughs> little, little, little under $23,000. Now think about that. 
a Model T in today's dollars, you know, because you go back then, a, a pound of hamburger was less than 10 cents. A double scoop ice cream cone was 3 cents back in 1908. And it was really good ice cream back then, I'm told. I wasn't there. Uh, so when you, when you look at this, you're talking $23,000 for a Model T. And again, people talk about business people and corporations and corporate greed and look at prices. No. That's what a Model T would cost in $2,010. Now think about a Model T. It wasn't enclosed. So one of the reasons why you didn't have a lot of traffic in cold weather was because you, you froze your rear end off. But then again, you froze your rear end off in a really nice carriage as well. You didn't have heating. You didn't have air conditioning. You didn't have lights on the Model T. You didn't have windshield wiper blades. You only had rear brakes. You didn't have front brakes. The ride was terrible. The shock absorber basically didn't exist. And it goes on and on and on. But that's what the equivalent price of a Model T would be in $2,010. Now, any, any Ford dealers in the room? Okay. Ford Motor Company, you can buy a Ford Focus. You know, lower end, high quality car, much better car today than a Model T. Has front and rear, rear brakes, has much more dependable tires has air conditioning and heating, has a radio, doesn't have leather seats, has lights, has wipers, etc. What do you think you can get a base model, base model model or a Ford Focus with those items in it today for? How much? You haven't bought a car in a while, have you? How much? Yeah, about 16,000. So think about what these incredible entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs have done. They are producing incredible products, and most people don't give credit to the fact that an automobile has made a lot more progress in terms of real price cuts. An automobile in, in real terms and in nominal terms by that measurement is less expensive today and it's a far better product, 20 times at least better today because of this entrepreneurial process. And, and again, what I would suggest to you is that the main thesis of what Richard was getting at is that when people are free, truly free to take risks, they don't always win, but the consumer does. It is the most moral and ethical process because of this economic cycle of human progress uh, uh, that uh, 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 Dr. Cox and I are, are uh, looking at and working on and doing some things associated with. And it is that, that, that process that, uh, you know, the Austrian tradition in economics from Schumpeter and Mises to Hayek and to, to you know, to great thinkers. And, and Dr. Ebeling is, is truly one of the one of the best known Austrian economists in the world today. Champions of the market process, champions of a free and just and moral and ethical society. Because at root, this is the cornerstone of capitalism. Capitalism is at root a moral and ethical system. Because in the end, a capitalist system does not favor government subsidies. A capitalist system does not favor government intervention, picking the winners and the losers. A capitalist system says at the heart of the process, it's you, the consumer, that drives this process of invention, innovation, and creative destruction. Out with the old, in with the new. Okay? So, as you look at this, this is a shot of the global economy. This comes from a lot of different sources. This is something that we produce quarterly uh, at the university. And as you look at it, um, 2009 was not a good year. In terms of global data, uh, it's the first year in the history of global data that the global economy's GDP was actually negative. 2010, you can see there from the data, showed some growth. Uh, the U.S. economy did uh, fairly well in 2010. But a lot of that was due to government spending and quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve... Uh, 
uh, you know, when, when, when I, you, I first read uh, headline QE2, I thought, you know, the QE1 and the QE2 were ships. Queen Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth II, I thought, I looked at it, I said, hey, Pam, maybe we'll go on vacation. And so the QE2, uh, um, it, it, you know, is a luxury liner. Queen Elizabeth II, uh, it, it travels from the U.S. to, to Europe. And, and we, uh, you know, no, it was really quantitative easing. And it was really the Federal Reserve's way of saying, we're printing a lot more money than GDP production dictates. And we're doing it to stimulate the economy. And it certainly had an effect. But uh, as you look at the Austrian malinvestment uh, theory of the business cycle, uh, Professor Hayek used to parallel it to being a drug addict. You know, initially you take uh, a drug like heroin, and what does it do? It picks you up. It, uh, it makes you feel good. It, 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 it elevates you. The problem is when the drug wears off, what do you do? When the drug wears off, you, you go through withdrawals withdrawals or a recession, you parallel it to a recession. And unless you continue to stimulate, you're going to have those high highs and those low lows. But eventually, if you continue to stimulate, the body collapses. And, and oftentimes, the drug addict dies. And it's a really interesting parallel with quantitative easing. Uh, the Federal Reserve stimulated the economy. And the real question that I'm going to ask you over the progression of the rest of my talk is, what are we doing at root or at base to make our economy sustainable and admirable over the long term? Okay? So I would say to you right now, uh, I am not, uh, I'm confused as an economist, and I'm not real optimistic so far with 2011. Uh, first quarter GDP growth was less than two. Uh, it, uh, most of our stats have uh, got a lot of background in mathematical economics, and, and uh, everything I was ever taught says that we need at least 2.3% growth in GDP on a regular basis for a capitalist economy to grow. Uh, 3.4 to 3.5 is really a sweet spot over the long term. You'd like it to be higher, but you certainly don't want it to be lower. Uh, our, for, our first quarter of 2011, uh, again, was 1.8%, less than 2. Uh, it, it's not good to create jobs, to create a sustainable economy. Um, I don't think uh, that uh, the second quarter is looking any better, but we'll, we'll see uh, uh, where, where that progresses. But again, this just gives you a good snapshot of, of the U.S. and the, the global economy, and I hate to say that... Uh, our monthly economic outlook, if any of you would like to receive it, uh, make certain I have your email and I'll put you on the list. It goes out to about uh, 6,000 people each month. Um, you know, we've been not very optimistic, and unfortunately, we've been pretty right over the, over the last year. One of the things that I would also say to you that we have to start to take a look at is, uh, on a global basis and for the U.S., and, and I'm going to give you some, some thoughts and some topics. Uh, uh, I'm not going to have a time, time to go into detail on any one of these. I'll be giving a talk uh, in, uh, um, in November at the APEC SEMA convention in Las Vegas on global oil prices and the impact on the, on the economy. If you look here, the, the U.S. Is, um, is one of the world's largest producers of oil, uh, but we are certainly the world's largest consumer of oil. Uh, we consume less oil than we produce in terms of GDP, which is a very interesting uh, measurement. There are a number of European countries that their percentage of world GDP is lower than their percentage of oil consumption. But we are the world's largest uh, consumer of oil, and we are a net importer of oil. Now, I would also say to you that, uh, again, a topic that a number of our speakers uh, uh, touched on, uh, uh, Dr. Ebeling mentioned it uh, in terms of his... Uh, 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 testimony before uh, Congressman Ron Paul's committee uh, a week ago. I want you to look at some of the factors that influence oil. This is a, a, an analysis of oil, and it's an analysis of oil over a relatively long period of time. I'll, I'll be updating some of these slides over the next uh, couple of weeks uh, to have the last uh, uh, um, two years of oil prices in here. But I, I, I chose this slide for, for a reason. And that is that as you look at the 1990s, 
the 1990s saw oil average less than $20 a barrel. Now, there are a lot of individuals out there that will say that oil, uh, because of this dramatic increase in worldwide demand by the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, that's why oil prices are going to be $200 a barrel. I don't buy that. I think, and, and, I, and I've, I've done a pretty good job of uh, predicting or assessing oil prices over the last four or five years, I, I would argue that oil prices, based on increased demand, and there certainly is increased demand from China, from India, from Brazil, from Russia, from the United States, increased demand, it, it, it takes oil in an open free market, I think, to somewhere between uh, uh, 50 and $70 a barrel. So what explains why oil is higher than that? I, I'll tell you that there are two factors. Uh, factors that, that exist in, in many ways. The worst place to explore for oil is the United States. Uh, I would say, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very irrational energy policy because we have none. And in many cases, what we do is we discourage the increased supply. There are incredible amounts of oil, as I noted, in Michigan. State and federal law make it difficult to extract oil. Uh, we have a lot of oil off the east and west coast of the United States. But we say that uh, uh, we're not going to let people uh, drill for oil. Whether you know it or not, this administration has been very anti increased oil exploration, but we just gave the Brazilians about $6 billion to uh, 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 put oil derricks in off their coast to extract oil off their coast. Not free market, not capital that Jonathan was talking about from American investors, but U.S. government money to the Brazilians to extract uh, and explore for oil off their coast. Uh, I, I don't think that the Founding Fathers were talking about that as the proper role of, of government. In Alaska, in Anwar, there are tremendous amounts of oil available, but we refuse to, to go after it. We, uh, uh, President Clinton, I think, made a, 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 uh, a decision that I think he is regretting, at least to some degree today, where we took a large portion of the state of Alaska and made it very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult with some laws to explore for oil in, in roughly 80% of the state, including a very rich area that we refer to as the Anwar region of, of Alaska. Montana, Wyoming, Colorado have incredible amounts of shale oil, oil that's embedded in rock, and uh, uh, we make it very difficult to extract that, even when prices go up, uh, because of regulations on, on the technology to extract that oil. Uh, the United States has, uh, by far and away, the world's largest supply of coal. Uh, even though we have made incredible um, progress in terms of coal-powered uh, plants, uh, the sulfuric and nitric oxides out of the produced by a modern coal plant today, with coal pul uh, what they call the coal pulverization process, uh, the sulfuric and nitric oxides are one quarter what they used to be. You could take four coal-powered uh, plants in Michigan with one of the new technologically advanced uh, plants. You could take four of them, take them offline, bring one online. It would meet the power grid demand of all four of the old plants and produce less than half of the sulfuric and nitric oxides of the four old plants combined. We had a chance to have one in Midland. It was going to help provide the power so that Dow Corning, which is one of the world's largest semiconductor producers, could have the power to add the third phase to the Hemlock Semiconductor Plant. Governor Granholm said no. Her um, green-oriented regulatory group encouraged her to say no. And that plant, with $2 billion worth of investments, is now being built as we speak in the state of Tennessee. So these are things that you have to take a look at. And to me, it just made no sense at all. I'm not anti-environment, and I'm certainly a big believer in reducing pollution. But when you looked at all the facts, Dr. Matchek and I did the economic impact study for that. And Dr. Matchek, whether you know it or not, his doctorate is from Cornell in environmental economics. And uh, in the end, it looked like a sure winner for the state of Michigan. Would have been a sure winner for the governor. And, 
the regulatory body made it impossible for, for the company uh, that was going to build the plant to build the plant. And you know, th that was over 1,000 jobs and $2 billion in, in construction uh, opportunities for mid-Michigan ended up in Tennessee. And the problem is, in a lot of cases, as Jonathan was pointing out, they end up outside of the borders of the United States. So number one reason for higher oil prices today is we're not letting the supply uh, function move to the marketplace. We are preventing a lot of the supply from coming to the market. Uh, and this, this just shows the, the worst year in history for real and nominal oil prices, 2008. Financial crisis hit, world demand fell apart, and prices obviously fell. But here's the second factor, and this is what Dr. Ebeling was talking about to some degree, as was Dr. Cox. And, and that is uh, uh, when Richard had an exchange with uh, Congressman Barney Frank, it was over the, over the discussion of how much the United States should be involved in world conflict. And uh, as we take a look at the size and scope of government, the size and scope of our budget, one of the things that this country is going to have to understand that it can't be the world's uh, a police force, should not be the world's police force, and certainly today, gang, cannot afford to pay for being the world's police force. But what I would say to you is look at this chart because this chart clearly and unequivocally points out that when we get into conflict, especially conflict in the Middle East, oil prices spike up. And it's amazing to me that politicians don't want to talk about the fact that their public policy activity has had a lot to do with oil prices spiking up. You look at wars in the Middle East. You look at, uh, you know, this graph depicts, uh, you know, three conflicts in the Middle East, and every time, what does it mean? It means that oil prices are spiking up. And we blame those evil speculators, and, and those speculators play a very important function. You know, those speculators, when they're, wrong, when they're wrong, they lose a lot of money. When they're right, they make a lot of money, but they ensure that the supply of oil will be there. And speculators become worried when there's a conflict in the Middle East and there's the potential that the Straits of Hormuz, where 40% of the world's oil flows on a daily basis, uh, uh, that, that if there is a, a conflict in the Straits of Hormuz and uh, we reduce the supply of oil by 40%, prices are going to go up. And you folks are too young to remember, but in the 1970s when we had wage and price controls, especially on oil, we put caps on the price that oil companies could charge for oil, and we didn't have a, uh, an issue of prices going up initially. They eventually went up, but we had shortages because the oil companies said, we can't supply the oil at this price. So we had the worst problem. We couldn't get oil. We couldn't, the supply was shut off because the oil companies were saying, we're closing these wells because you're only letting us charge $8 and our cost is $12, we're not going to produce oil and lose money. So the question is, do you want the government to regulate the price and stop the supply, or do you want to make sure the speculators are out there making certain the supply is there and letting the market price dictate? And so the point is, one of the things you haven't had to worry about is the supply of oil and gasoline through these conflicts when the market process is allowed to take place. And these speculators are not evil people. They are simply performing a market function. However, let's talk about the root cause. In many of these cases, we forget about the fact that maybe we shouldn't have been involved. Maybe if we didn't back one side versus the other, we might not have had the conflict that led to the potential loss of supply. Should we have backed Saddam Hussein, I'm sorry, should we have challenged Saddam Hussein, and eventually Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and we stop him tell him he needs to move out, send troops in to get him out of Kuwait. And in the meantime, a third of the oil wells in Kuwait were either shut down or on fire. 
it adversely impacted the supply of oil and prices went up. So my point with you is that it's interesting, a lot of people call Ronald Reagan the, uh, 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 you know, the trigger-happy cowboy president, but if you look at his foreign policy, Ronald Reagan rarely sent troops in to any country. He sent them into Grenada. But Reagan didn't send troops into, uh, 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 into uh, 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 Libya. He sent a few planes over there. But what was interesting is that Ronald Reagan was a very tough foreign policy person, but was not the kind of guy that uh, uh, was, was, was interested in putting soldiers at harm's way. And, and it's interesting that uh, there was a lot more militaristic activity under Bush one, under President Clinton, and under, Pres and, and under President Bush two, than there was under Ronald Reagan. Because I think Reagan understood economics much better and understood this impact of foreign policy and prices. So understand that um, right now, the, the recent increase in oil prices, it's not due to, a, to, a, to a, uh, like a number of the news people will say, oh, well, it's an increase in global demand. No, it's not. GDP is not growing. The, the use of oil is, has not increased uh, that dramatically uh, relative to the supply. It, it, is, it is the worry that these conflicts in the Middle East could result in a, a dramatic uh, uh, reduction in supply. And, and I was listening to a member of Congress say, well, this, this is a ridiculous argument because we don't buy any of our oil from Libya. Libya may provide 5% of the world's oil, but we don't buy it from Libya, so it won't affect us. Well, do you think that if Libya, if Gaddafi set all the oil wells in Libya on fire like he's threatened, and 5% of the world's oil is off the market, and let's say the British buy all of their oil from Libya, do you think the Brits are just going to say, hey, well, pip, pip, hey, we're, we're out of oil, we're going to have to do without. And, uh, you know, it's too bad, we bet on Gaddafi and we lost. Or do you think the Brits might turn around and say to the Canadians, who supply a lot of the U.S. oil, hey, we don't have any oil from Libya, uh, we'll pay you five bucks more a barrel than the Americans are paying you for oil. Do you think they might do that? Yes. And do you think the Canadians would say, okay, we'll take that five dollars extra a barrel and we'll sell it to you. And, and, and it's amazing to me, this is a member of Congress that doesn't understand the focus of or the impact of a global free enterprise society, a global uh, economy. Okay, now, here's another factor to take a look at. As you look at the world economy, another problem that the United States has is that, again, we don't have a rational energy policy. As you look at the United States, we get a tremendous amount of our total BTUs. You know, this is, this is an analysis that's done every uh, two or three years. Uh, this is a couple of years old, but it's, it still rings true for today. Uh, we get uh, a large amount of our total energy from oil. Second is coal. But as you go through, look at uh, uh, natural gas, alternative energy, look at nuclear power. Nuclear power provides about 45% of the total energy needs to Japan. Now, Japan has some issues with the current nuclear power plant issue. It was hit by an earthquake and then a tsunami. Uh, the difficulty for the Japanese is that they have no oil production and they happen to live in a, a very difficult area where uh, it is in a, an earthquake zone. But the fact of the matter is, nuclear power has been very safe. It has been a, a, a uh, uh, very cost-effective way over the long term of producing energy. But when's the last time you heard of a new nuclear power plant being built in the United States? we get less than 10% of our energy from nuclear because we have this anti-nuclear mentality when in reality nuclear energy has been very safe including Three Mile Island. There's not a documented death from the Three Mile Island accident. And I would say to you that um, unless we start to be more rational with nuclear power, we start to be more rational with coal we start to open up some of the government lands that we know have oil 
and allow that uh, uh, leasing to take place, we're going to see continued uh, uh, increases in energy prices, and we're going to be held hostage by other countries as it relates to energy. And last but not least, I am not anti-green. I am, uh, uh, again, uh, very, very much in favor of the environment, own land up uh, uh, north with my wife, have a boat up north, uh, uh, you know, love uh, the clean uh, uh, lakes, uh, the beautiful environment of this state, like the fact that I breathe in clean air in Midland, Michigan. But the key, the important part, the important point to note is that green energy, the cost of it relative to its ability to provide BTUs to the United States isn't there. You know, if, if you listen to Michael Cox, he was absolutely right about airbags. The government didn't invent airbags. It was a private company that invented airbags. The airbag technology wasn't ready to be introduced to the market. Government forced it ahead of schedule. There were a lot of accidents. It hadn't been tested well. Babies were, were, were killed. There were a couple of people decapitated by airbags because we were forced by regulation to introduce the technology too soon. But there were companies working on it and wanting to bring it to the market. But even insurance companies said, we're not ready for airbags yet. Government said, you have to have them. And the fact is, all the green technology that we have today comes from the private sector. The question is, if it's feasible and its market uh, um, uh, pricing is such that people will buy it and companies can make profits, it will make it to the market. My point is, I'm in big time favor of green technology. Most of it is not yet cost effective, and I think we're pushing it to the market sooner than we should. But in the interim, there's a lot of technology that we have and could bring to the market and should bring it to the market sooner. Okay? All right, here's the other problem, for example, with oil. These are just examples of all the other uses for oil. So oil is not just a lubricant for automobiles and machines. It's not just converted into gasoline or diesel fuel. Oil is used in pharmaceuticals. Oil is used in, in, in a number of different products. This is, I've got a list that's a, as a double A to double Z. And so these are just things that um, oil is used for that uh, makes the demand for oil uh, a lot more uh, um, uh, challenging uh, in, in, in helps drive up the price than the obvious today. Okay? Now, as you look at it in terms of the global economy, you know, these are just some of the challenges that uh, we have to take a look at. And, and a factor that, that um, if I were the president, I would be spending a lot of time talking to the Chinese about the fact that they won't let their currency float freely. Uh, it's my view that the yuan uh, at 6.8 yuan equals one dollar, the Chinese currency. Uh, it's, it's that way because the government holds it artificially uh, low. I think if the Chinese were forced to enter a true free global free enterprise society and they let their currency float freely, I think the yuan would probably trade at somewhere between three or four to one. And what would happen is the following. Chinese prices on products being exported to the U.S. would go up, and U.S. products pricing, U.S. manufactured products being sold to China would go down. Uh, U.S. manufacturing would be a lot more competitive, Chinese manufacturing would be less competitive, and the Chinese certainly wouldn't be holding the surplus of dollars at the level that they're holding in them today. And so, in essence, we allow the Chinese to have the best of both worlds. Uh, I'm a big fan of China, I've been going there for a long time, love the Chinese people, love their courageous movement from communism toward the free market, but I say it's about time we stop uh, this subsidization and have them enter uh, the, uh, the uh, 21st century as a truly free economy. Because the distortions that it creates in the Chinese economy will be helpful to the Chinese over the long run as well. Okay? Now, as you take a look at a number of different factors, look at automobiles. Uh, the, the U.S. auto industry, as part of the global auto industry, global auto industry has been growing leaps and leaps and bounds. It's one of the best indicators of the global economy, and certainly it's a strong indicator of the health of this state and the U.S. economy. But most of that growth that you see in this chart, gang, is not happening 
in the United States or Europe. It's happening in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That's been the vast majority of growth. And so when you're looking at investment funds, you're looking at mutual funds, this is why a lot of investors are saying you should have some of your investments in globalization. And I would suggest to you that your globalization ought to focus on, on uh, these countries because they, they have done well and some of the index funds my wife and I have been in have, have done well uh, in, in the, the growth in GDP and the growth in automobile production and other areas of production reflects the confidence that, that I think is at least well placed, uh, uh, has been well, well placed to date. Uh, this shows you the Chinese uh, economy and automobile production. Last year, over 18 million automobiles were sold in China. About 13 million were manufactured in China. China manufactured more cars last year than we sold in the U.S. Uh, the Great Recession killed the U.S. auto industry almost. It was the worst period in 45 or 50 years for the U.S. economy in 2009. And uh, we dropped to <coughs> just over, excuse me, 10 point, what was that? Just over 10 million automobiles sold in the U.S. Sold means we manufactured less than uh, 10 million vehicles. Uh, we had a comeback in 2010. We're looking better in 2011. But 2011, we're, we may manufacture 13 and a half, we may sell 13 and a half million vehicles. But that's down from our peak, our best year ever, of uh, one stat says 17.8, another stat says 18.1. So the Chinese, in essence, have sold more cars last year than our best year ever. And it's, uh, it, you know, it's pause for uh, concern here, but it's also an indication of what's happening in, in a place like China. Okay, now as you look at uh, uh, the U.S. economy, you, again, just look at what's happened uh, to automobiles made by the big three. And look at the projection of automobiles made by the big three. Uh, what's happened is that the transplants, Toyota, Nissan, uh, BMW, Mercedes, and others, uh, they have uh, come to the United States, Hyundai, they are producing here, they're doing well, and um, uh, much of the growth, much of the jobs in the U.S. are, are, are due to the transplants, and, and as, Rich, or as um, Michael pointed out, they're not ready yet, but the, the Chinese are going to be here. And they're going to be here in the not-too-distant future. I disagree with my dear friend Michael Cox. I think the Indians are, are quite a ways uh, from being very competitive in, in the U.S. market. However, there are two things to note. Much of the Chinese success is due to companies like Shanghai Volkswagen and Shanghai GM. General Motors is doing very well in China, where there are, unfortunately, for the U.S. market, less regulations. And as Mike pointed out and Jonathan pointed out, lower tax rates. Here, you know, the communists, I was in China in 1989, right before Tiananmen Square, and I'm thinking, what an economic basket case. The, you know, the, the thing, the average wages were less than $500. Uh, the, the economy was not moving in the right direction. And now you look at it today, our, our top average corporate tax rate is 39.27%, and their top corporate tax rate is just over 24% on business. You know, they're still a communist country, and what are we in a relative sense? So their wage rates are going up. You went to China because of low wages. Their wage rates are increasing, and at the management level, I talked to my friends at Dow Chemical and Dow Corning that have major operations in Shanghai, and they'll tell you that they're paying their top management people as much as, as uh, they do in the U.S. at Dow Corning and Dow Chemical. The wage rates of the hourly workers are increasing dramatically. In five, six years, the wage advantage in manufacturing won't exist for the Chinese. They're now saying, well, if the wage advantage goes away, how can we still compete? We better make certain we have low tax costs. And so they're beating us in wages right now, and they're beating us in taxes on business. And, and my point, the other point I'd make with you is that so not only are American companies, Ford of, of China, uh, GM of China, doing well and finding out that these are their best, best growth places and their best future profit places, but, you know, you hear a lot of Americans saying, well, you know, although, you know I'm still not buying a, a, you know, a Japanese car even if it's, if it's made in Kentucky. 
And you forget about the heyday of General Motors. Opel is an American car company in Germany. It's the it's the it's the European one of the European divisions of General Motors. Vauxhall is a is a automobile made uh, by General Motors in England. Holden is an is a General Motors product produced in Australia. We've been doing this for a long time, and you know we can't as as citizens say, gee. A lot of our profits came back over the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s from England and from Germany and from Australia from our foreign operations and now be upset that there are transplants in the U.S. Uh, that, are, that are doing very well creating jobs in the U.S. And uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the key point is this, these charts show you that most people don't call Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors anymore the big three. They're called the Detroit three. Because they're no longer one, two, and three, or one, three, and five, or one, two, and four in the world. General Motors is number two, Ford is number five, and Chrysler's not even in the top ten. And Chrysler's now part of Fiat. And, and so from a relative sense, uh, we have not competed as well as we could. Here, and this is a big theme of what we're talking about at, at the Freedom Seminar, and you ought to look at into the future. There are three ways to finance government. You tax, you borrow, and you inflate. And uh, as you look at the United States today, again, do not take the word of anybody that's spoken here until you've validated it. Trust but verify. But you're going to find out that you've gotten great information. The United States is becoming one of the high highest income tax states or countries in the world from a personal level and we're we're number two and we're going to be number one in terms of Japan. Uh, I was talking with Mike after his talk we haven't quite become number one. The Japanese uh, were going to cut their uh, federal income tax but they've delayed it because of the issues with the the tsunami and the earthquake. And, and it'll, it was supposed to happen in April, and I just saw recently that they actually delayed it uh, from the date that they set. But we have the second highest corporate income tax rate in the industrialized world, and we're becoming, and if President Obama's tax increases go forward, most industrialized countries are cutting their income taxes on, on individuals. We're raising them, and we're, we're up there at, at number one or number two in corporate income taxes, and it's not because we've raised them. It's because the rest of the world has cut their taxes. So remember that the most important word in economics is the word relative in comparison to others. So you tax. That's a factor. Borrowing. You know, you've heard it from a number of the speakers. Our national debt is getting ready to top 100% of GDP. It makes it very difficult to borrow money. And when you have that much debt relative to your productive assets, rating agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's downgrade your investment quality. People are going to eventually refuse to buy your bonds. And I mentioned to you yesterday, that's what happened to Germany. The Germans had high taxes. Their deficits were, were over 100% of GDP. People weren't buying German bonds. And so the government resorted to the third category of financing government. They printed money. And that's what these, the QE1, the QE2, the quantitative easing. Federal Reserve says, we're going to start to print money, not because our GDP is gro growing, but we're doing it to finance government. And that's the root cause of inflation. And you're already starting to see inflation at base levels going up here in 2010 in the United States. And people are refusing to buy, or they want a higher rate of return on the bonds to buy US debt instruments. So it, it, it's, it's not a rosy picture. I'm very optimistic about this country, but right now, the reason I'm optimistic is because I have faith in bright young people like yourselves. Like a number of the spe speakers have said, I'm a fan of the Tea Party movement and what's happening. We have to take our government back and say, stop it. 
The issue is not that we don't have enough taxes. The issue is not that we should borrow more money. The issue is not that we should inflate. The issue is government spends too much. Government is too large. We have to reduce the size and scope of government. And again, here's a chart. You look at uh, what's happened with the national debt. And as I said recently, it's amazing to me, from 1776 to 1981, it took us 205 years to run up a national debt that was slightly less than a trillion dollars. And from 1981 to date, or in 30 years, we've taken the national debt from just under a trillion dollars to 14.3 trillion dollars. It is reprehensible, it is immoral, it is unethical, it is irresponsible. And we need to get the size and scope of government under control. And as you take a look at it, a look at the debt to GDP. Look at the history of it. We are getting ready, ladies and gentlemen. It's not gonna, it, the economy will not grow enough over the next year. In the next year, we will have a debt, a national debt, greater than 100% of GDP. It's a fact. There's nothing other than the second coming of our, our, of our Lord that will stop it. And again, here's just a chart that shows you the, the tax impact. This is where we're at. We're number two soon to become number one in terms of corporate income taxes. And it's not debatable. And as the, the question that I asked uh, Jonathan, he, he got into it at the end. You know, on top of where we are with our regular tax rate, if you're Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan, and, and you're one of the few economic bright spots in the state of Michigan, Midland County is a bright spot. The uh, 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 Dow Chemical in a, as a global competitor is a bright spot. And, you know, Midland County is doing well versus most of the counties in Michigan. But think about this. If you're Dow Chemical and you have a plant in Ireland, and your major competitor out of Germany, BASF, second largest chemical company in the world, they have a plant in Ireland. You pay 12.5% on your profits. BASF brings their profits back to Germany because they're a territorial tax system. They pay no more taxes. They've got that, let's say they make a million, they bring back $875,000, they bring it back to Germany, they don't pay any additional taxes, they can invest it any way they want. We bring it back to the United States and we have to pay the difference between the 12.5 and the 39.27 with about a point and a half reduction. And right now President Obama is calling that a loophole and wants to close the loophole. But he doesn't want to just take the total 12 and a half plus the additional tax in the U.S. up to 39.27. During his campaign, he said, you ought to pay the 12.5 in Ireland and then pay the 39.27 average rate in the United States. It's ridiculous. It's why American companies have over $2 trillion outside of the United States because they don't want to bring it back because it, it, it is harmful to the company and its ability to sustain difficult times. Now, uh, here's, here's uh, 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 as you take a look at um, the fact that in the OECD countries, it doesn't include the emerging countries of Russia, India, and China. But look at their top tax rates. India, Russia, China. All communist countries 20 years ago all emerging from communism, moving toward capitalism, and every one of them has a corporate tax rate that is substantially lower than ours. And by the way, if you look at the OECD countries, our tax rate is 39.27. They average about 24%, those countries combined. Uh, personal income taxes, here's the problem. Rich people do pay taxes. Top 1% of income tax uh, income earners, they earned about 24% of the income and paid over 40% of the taxes. The problem is, and this is income tax, this is not social security taxes. That's an investment according to the government. That's an investment in your future. That's a lockbox retirement system. 
income taxes, the bottom 50% paid less than 3% of income tax. And, 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 and it's always interesting because people say, where did you get that from? I said the IRS. This is IRS tax data. This isn't, uh, you know, Nash or Ebling in our, in our um, you know, um, uh, 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 um, clouded view of a free market economy, extrapolating data. This, you know, it's a, I always say that I was speaking to a group of um, Democrats about a month ago, and I showed some of these slides, and somebody said, where'd you get this from? I said, the IRS. I said, look, I hate to confuse the debate with the facts, but, you know, your people put this together. You know, because this comes from the Obama administration's IRS. Now, another factor to take a look at is, uh, and a problem that this country faces, is the fact that so much of what the government now spends today is mandatory, meaning it's, it's law. There's not a lot of flexibility. If you folks are working for a corporation, if you're working for Dow Chemical, you could cut anything in your budget. And if you looked at the federal government, it was a lot easier to cut government spending because roughly 27% in the mid-1960s was mandatory. So you had to change the law to cut that 27%. Today, it's roughly 60% of all government budget spending is mandatory. And that's why it's tough for these folks to cut the budget. It's not easy, but we are looking for people that are statesmen, stateswomen, patriots, people of courage and conviction, because you're going to have to touch Social Security. You're going to have to restructure Medicaid. If you're going to get us out of this financial crisis, we, we need people that are rooted in the principles of what made this country great, because these are the individuals that have to change the financial structure of the country we live in. Now, if you look at the national debt, here's another problem. This is just gang interest on the national debt. And you know what's crazy about interest on the national debt? You go back and you look at it. Last year, we paid almost $414 billion interest on the national debt. Almost $414 billion. And that's just interest. People, there's no principle. You wonder where the banks got the idea We'll give you no interest loans, no payment on principal. Hell, our government's been doing it for decades. $414 billion was the interest payment on the national debt. This is one of the three largest items in the federal budget. And gang, there's no principal payment. We're not even throwing in a couple billion just for good faith to reduce the principal. We have a $14.3 trillion national debt and we're paying $414 billion in interest on the national debt. And again, I don't want to confuse the debate with the facts, but this comes from the Treasury, U.S. Treasury Department's website and their report on the national debt for 2010. Now, the other point to note is there are a blended number of ways of financing the debt. And in two, fiscal year 2010, which ended in October of 2010, the average interest rate, when you put them all together, was 3.05%. Uh, if you believe inflation's increasing, if you believe that we're losing faith in, our, in the U.S. debt, that the Moody's and Standard & Poor's could reduce the U.S. national or U.S. debt instruments like treasury bills, bonds, uh, to below AAA rating. When you reduce the rating, the interest rate goes up. So let's say the national debt goes up to $16 trillion over the next couple of years. Interest rates go to 4 or 5%. You're all bright. Do the math. Let's say, let's say the average interest rate goes from 3.05 to... Um, to 5%. And then let's say that our national debt conservatively over the next three or four years goes to uh, 16 trillion. That's 800 billion interest on the national debt. 
Do you realize that 14, or $414 billion, if that were the GDP of a country, it would be in the top 25 economies in the world? And we're basically wasting that on interest on the national debt because of our irresponsible attitudes. And, and again, look at the interest rate. Three component parts of an interest rate. Debtor's risk premium, right? Originary rate, your time preference, and inflationary risk premium. I'm very worried about inflation, and if you look at interest rates before you were twinkles in your parents' eyes, ask your mom and dad about the late 70s and early 80s. We had the prime interest rate in this country was 21.5%. There were businesses paying two points above the prime rate. The economy was in terrible shape. And the vast majority of the reason for the interest rate being that high was that inflation one year was over 13%. So those are the component parts of an interest rate. When inflation goes up, banks don't want to be paid back with cheaper dollars so they drive up the interest rate because of the inflationary cost in the future and that's something that you're going to have to take a look at and worry about and again with this slide i would simply say to you it's the cornerstone of philosophy 110 it's the cornerstone of macroeconomics you know there are three major component parts in the economy households government and business and I would suggest to you today that we need to spend some time looking at the proper role of government. Government is a lot different today than it was not too long ago. What is the size of government or what should it be? What is the role of government today and what should it be? And it's why we have courses like Philosophy 110 and Philosophy 401. And we call them the philosophy of American life and business or the philosophy of American enterprise. It's what made this country great, and I'm going to show you a couple of historic slides to maybe make you think. So this versus that. Can we have the size and scope of government and have as much invention and innovation per this uh, chart and this uh, economic cycle of human progress? You know, right now I think that there are a lot of things that we need to do more effectively. You know, as Jonathan pointed out, 49 out of 50 states have a balanced budget amendment. Our tax system's broken. We've got to look at taxing in a different way and taxing less. We've got to cut back the size and scope of government. Uh, if, you, if you ever see D Business Magazine, it's the most popular business magazine in Metro Detroit. In the current issue, Keith and I have an article, uh, Keith Pretty and I have an article on economic reforms in the state of Michigan. And one of the things that we've encouraged is that uh, uh, you, you, Jonathan's right that we, Governor Engler, in a bold and courageous move, uh, took all new hires and said, you're, we're going from a defined uh, 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 benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. It's interesting from a public policy perspective. Richard and I uh, uh, have a, a, uh, a pension as teachers uh, at Northwood University, and it's no different than the, the plan that, that uh, uh, professors have at, uh, at, at state universities. And at TIA CREF, uh, we make uh, 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 X amount of money, and the university uh, puts in 8%, and we match it. And then Richard manages his account as he sees fit within the scope. I manage mine. Well, why don't we do that for K through 12 teachers? Why don't we say to K through 12 teachers that um, uh, instead of having these unfunded liabilities, it works very well for university professors. If you said to a university professor at the University of Michigan, we're going to take your TIA CREF away and we're going to give you the state pension fund for teachers, they'd say, you're nuts. I do a lot better. I'm a lot better off. And the beautiful part of it is every, every month, Richard and I get statements. We can look at it online every two weeks. We put our money in. Northwood puts it in. And then it's done. There's no unfunded liability. The problem is with, with uh, K through 12 teachers' pensions, oftentimes the school district doesn't put the money in. And if it were a private company doing that, they'd go to jail. But somehow they get away with it and we have these unfunded liabilities into the future. So we, we need to come up with a lot more market-oriented, a lot more rational solutions. And once we educate people, it's a lot simpler to do. 
Okay, now as you look at the state of Michigan, um, state of Michigan has been an economic basket case for the last uh, decade. Uh, state of Michigan has some real problems with, um, with uh, um, home prices. State of Michigan uh, has lost over a million jobs in the last 10 years. Our GDP performance has lagged the, the, the national average. Uh, the employment problems in, in Michigan are much greater than those of the, the economy as a whole. And, and so as we look at the Michigan economy, things are starting to rebound. Our new governor is looking at and, and, and I think is courageous enough to make and take on some of the, the, the difficult issues and problems uh, that we're facing today. So as, as we look at uh, uh, this state, I, I think that we have reason for optimism uh, with the new governor. And it's interesting that if we can either have a more rational relationship between unions and management, and if that doesn't take place, then I think this governor is ready to try to, with this current legislature, make Michigan a right to work state. And meaning you don't have to join a union to work for a unionized company. You know, one of the reasons why Texas is doing well outside of the fact that Texas uh, has no income tax at the state level, it's a right to work state. And if your company is unionized and you want to join the union in a manufacturing sense in Texas, you can join it. But if another one of you says, hey, I'm not joining the union, they can't force you to be a member of the union in order to have a job on the assembly line at a factory. So being a right to work state, or at least a more rational union policy because of a threat of a right to work state, would help the labor environment in Michigan. Because real wages are, are down. It is not very advantageous to move to a lot of countries for wage rates. Interestingly enough, you look at a second tier new employee, member of the UAW working for General Motors, they're starting out at $14 an hour in 2010 dollars. I did an interview with uh, NBC uh, uh, out of Flint uh, uh, about two weeks ago related to the new contract. In 1971, 40 years later, a new worker in, in the same spot on an assembly line in a GM plant started out at $14 an hour. Think about what $14 an hour bought you in 1971 versus $14 today. So wage rates are a lot different. And if the unions were more rational, they'd say, hey, we'll take 14 an hour, but how about some profit-sharing incentives if we do well? And there are some great examples. Lincoln Electric in, in uh, um, uh, Cleveland. Anderson Window out of uh, Wisconsin. These are companies that were highly unionized, almost went bankrupt. The companies were ready to close the door. And some innovative managers and workers got together they ended up in both cases voting out the union. And the end result is these employees are now making close to 100 grand an hour a year on average, but more than 50% of their wages come from profit sharing and bonuses. And when the company does well, they do well. When the company doesn't do well, they don't do well. And these hourly workers are some of the best innovators and some of the best suggestion providers at those companies. But I know you've heard of Anderson Window. It's a world-class producer of primary and replacement windows for housing. We export them all over the world. And Lincoln Electric is the world's largest producer of arc welding machines, and it almost went bankrupt and almost went out of business 25 years ago. So it can be done, and it can be done in this country with the right kind of rational uh, 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 economic public policy. Uh, inflation, uh, like in most places, I think uh, it, it's, it's been low, but I think we have worries here in the state. And uh, as you look at personal income, uh, there has not been a lot of growth uh, uh, here in Michigan along those lines. And, and again, as, as we take a look at uh, uh, some of the adjustments uh, for inflation, uh, the, 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 the wage rate issue in Michigan is... Um, is, is not good for workers, but potentially could be attractive for, uh, for new businesses. Uh, this is just some general overall data on the Michigan economy uh, as, as it relates to um, how well it's performed. And as you look at it, you see some of the very difficult uh, issues associated with uh, 
with uh, poor performance. We used to be uh, in the top 20 in, in every category 30 years ago, and, and we're not because, again, as Jonathan said, people and companies can vote with their feet. And we've lost over a million jobs in the last 11 years because this has not been a good and admirable place for business to be. And as business leaves the state, employees leave the state in, in seeking business uh, uh, elsewhere. Now, the last thing that I want to tell you, and I will make these available for you, but there's some great data uh, in terms of, of the U.S. Uh, in 1900 uh, versus 1999 that the, uh, that the uh, uh, Joint Committee of Congress uh, produced in a report, Joint Economic Committee of Congress uh, produced. And uh, I'll make those slides available with this uh, presentation online. And the thing that I would say you ought to, to take a look at or you ought to, to think about is the fact that in 1900, Government consumed, write this down, 6.8% of GDP. 6.8% of GDP. But the interesting fact is that only 2.2% of it was at the federal level. Okay? Only 2.2% was at the federal level. 4.6% was local and state government. Today, government consumes almost 40% of GDP. Now, you might say 6.8 was too low. I happen to think it was just right. Today, government consumes 40% of GDP, and some people say it's more like 45. But if you take official government data, it's 40% of GDP, and almost 25% of that is at the federal level, and 15% is at the local and the state level. And again, this is data from the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. And if you look at that, ladies and gentlemen, and then you go back to this particular chart, I trust the private sector and those dollars being in the hands of private profit-seeking men and women, private profit-seeking entrepreneurs, to create the jobs and to create the, 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 the vision and the prosperity that we call the American dream, much more so than government. And there are two problems today. Number one, for the vast majority of the history of this country, we said government should be strong and limited at the federal government level, and most decisions should be made at the state and local level. And from 1776, until the, the early 1930s, government consumed well under 20% of GDP, and the state and local government was much larger combined than the federal government. Today, the federal government is not only assuming much greater control over the economy, and you can't know as much in Washington about what you need in Midland or in Detroit as you do at the local level, so we've reversed that. We've, what made the country great was that our focus was on local and state government and very little decision making other than the national defense and, 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 and the, the courts at the Supreme Court and federal level emanated from Washington. And we left most of it to the local decision making. That ratio has changed and we've gone from government consuming under 7% of GDP to government consuming 40%. And it's a problem. It's got to change. And we are the people that need to make that change. Thank you very much. We have a, have a couple of minutes for questions, if you have any. Yes, no? Um, Tom, do we, have, a, we have a mic by any chance? Yes, I had a question on the energy policy. Yes, sir in particular to the subsidies we give to um, the oil companies. I know this past week they voted on it and they voted to renew them and they're at $12 billion a year. I was wondering how, if you could comment on how that affects. On the, on the subsidies? Yeah. Uh, here, here's what I'd say to you. I'm not a, a world expert on accounting, but I do have a couple of friends that are partners in, in um, uh, two of the three largest accounting firms in the United States. And, um, you know, they'll simply say to you that this is, um, 
This is a, a political ploy. And all the, these quote-unquote subsidies are, are simply depreciation. So in, in essence, if you want to you level the playing field in a business sense, then you have to say to every corporation that has a depreciating asset that we're going to take away your right to depreciate. I mean, even nonprofit organizations like Northwood, we depreciate assets. It's standard accounting practices. And so you want to say to General Motors, you've got an old plant and you can't depreciate it over the life of the plant. But that's what they're talking about. These quote unquote subsidies are simply, we, the government is saying, let's take away the ability to depreciate the life of an oil well. And, and to me, it's not a subsidy. And, and that's the biggest problem. It's amazing to me that all of a sudden it's your money, but no, it's the government's money. It, it, it's, it, and and that's, that's a fundamental problem. It's our money as individuals. It's our money as corporations. And what they're talking about is depreciating assets and keeping more of their own money. It's not a subsidy. The government's not giving them money. And so we have a tax system. We have a tax structure. And we're saying we want to take away the, 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 the depreciation of these assets. And, and I think it's silly. I hope that answers your question. Um, I had two questions if there's time. Sure. Um, one, was when you were talking about uh, also energy on the nuclear power, mm -hmm. um, what well, we just recently learned in our environmental science class at Northwood that uh, in terms of nuclear power, the uh, nuclear rods that are used in the plants um, eventually go bad and need to be replaced. And at that point, currently there's no proper way to dispose of the uranium after its useful life is over. And so I was also thinking that um, <clears throat> a lot of the times um, some of the arguments towards big businesses is that they're not environmentally sustainable. And so I was wondering what you thought in, t in terms of uh, you know, achieving our energy needs without sacrificing the environment. Well, I, I would, I would um, was that Dr. Beckham that made that argument about the nuclear rods? Uh, it was Gregorius. Uh, I, I, I would, um, I would uh, differ on that. I think that um, there, is a, uh, there is a lot of technology associated with taking spent nuclear fuel rods and putting them in glass and then burying them in sand areas. And, and we have found that um, uh, there is, uh, you know, historically, that, you know, the French have been doing this, the Japanese have been doing it uh, uh, with, with great success. And I, I would say to you, is it 100% is it uh, uh, environmentally uh, uh, um, pure, no, but it, but it, 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 it truly uh, uh, takes away the environmental risk. The other thing is that you know, there have been um, uh, great stories of nuclear scientists putting um, uh, sleeping bags on the roof of nuclear power plants and sleeping there for a month and then being tested for radiation. And, 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 and so the, uh, you know, nuclear power is not without a risk nor is power in an automobile. But you know, we, we forget about the fact that human progress has been very interesting. Before the automobile, we had the horse and buggy. And there was a certain deposit that the horse part of the horse and buggy made in the street, right? And they would make these deposits in the liquid form or the solid form. And, and we had tremendous problems in this country with all the diseases that were caused by animal excrement in the street the flies and, and the diseases that they would spread. And, and if you look at it today, the horse and buggy being replaced by the automobile with some of the pollution associated with the automobile and the fact that we know there are probably some people, a minute number that die associated with the pollution from an automobile, but we're far better off. There's far less pollution. There's far less disease from the automobile replacing the horse and buggy. And I would make the same evolutionary argument with, with nuclear power. So. Uh, it's not perfect, but I would, um, you know, if somebody gave me the chance, I'd, I'd take the risk and sleep in a sleeping bag on top of a nuclear power plant. And I would also say that uh, I think overall it is, it is something that we need in our energy mix. We, we cannot survive and prosper without that in our energy mix. And I, and I have some of my friends that are big, um, 
you know, they're, they're, they're organic farmers and they say, oh, you know, organic's the way to go. Well, you know, you remember that E. coli outbreak we had a few years ago? Where, they, where there was a problem with spinach coming from, um, I think, Iowa? Well, that was an organic farm. You know, they're against the kind of fertilizers and pesticides that Dow makes. And they want the organic kind, which is basically raw manure. And you know where type, uh, type 1 hepatitis comes from? Raw manure. You know where E. coli comes from? A big source of it is raw manure. So I I'm not against the organic side. I say let the market decide. But I also understand that uh, better limit living through bromine and chlorinated chemistry has um, dramatically improved our life expectancy. Are there some people that might get cancer from chlorinated chemistry? Probably. But the, what it, what it, the uh, incredible good that it provides relative to minor problems. Um, the other slide that I was going to show you, in, but in the interest of time I didn't, is that life expectancy has doubled. And a big reason for life expectancy doubling today is chlorinated chemistry, bromine chemistry, that has led to fertilizers, pesticides, water treatment plants. Do you know how many people that live today that would have died uh, because of uh, drinking tainted water that, that came from the Detroit Power or the Detroit water treatment plants? But before we had massive scale uh, um, uh, um, uh, ability to produce chlorine to purify water, look at the problems that existed. Well, you're welcome. Next question. <clears throat> comes up uh, when you were mentioning airbags earlier. Mm -hmm. When you did that, I pulled up some statistics real quick, and from the website I found it said that uh, about $2 billion a year is spent on airbags, and each year airbags save about 400 lives. So it's taken $2 billion to save 400 people. And I was reading that um, if that $2 billion was spent elsewhere, um, say like in the health sector or in other places, you could save many more than 400 lives. And I was also reading that uh, airbags cost, uh, add about $800 in cost to an automobile, and that was in 2002 dollars. And they add an average of 125 pounds to the weight of a car, which lowers gas mileage. And so, so really, the, these things here are, um, you know, um, prohibiting. Uh, Profit and are just you know they, they they seem kind of pointless and I was wondering um, or unadvantageous I should say uh, but what could we do to change something like this? Well, see for me I, I would say to you don't get me wrong on airbags uh, I'm a I'm a big believer in airbags and I think the market would have would have um, caused airbags to exist in the vast majority of cars. My only point is they, the market wasn't ready to bring them to market. Because if the market was, they would have had them in a wide-scale number of automobiles. The, the, you know, people are looking for competitive advantages around every corner, and the automobile companies have been historically some of the best inventors and innovators. All I'm saying is it's not because these companies are stupid or they don't care about their consumers that they don't put a product in the vehicle. They put it in as soon as they can and as soon as they think it's ready, and as soon as they think they can be protect, protected from massive lawsuits. Yeah, you remember the ratio of lawsuits in this country I mentioned versus Europe or versus Asia? Uh, you know, these are all factors, but my, my point is I think airbags would be here today, and I think most people would choose to pay the additional dollars for airbags. I would just like to see um, the market allow for a, you know, a low-priced automobile. And, 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 and there, you know, I would, if a consumer chose not to have airbags, I think it's, it's their choice. But I think the vast majority of people, I think the issue with seat belts is that seat belts would be in most automobiles. But I think if somebody wants to buy a base car that doesn't have seat belts and doesn't have airbags, they could do it. I would also say there's going to be not much of a secondary market for that vehicle uh, uh, upon resale. The other thing I would say to you, in, in all fairness, to airbags, Airbags, um, uh, you know, there, there would be a lot more people that would be maimed and injured and living a less than fruitful life if not for airbags. So those are deaths, but there are a lot of people, you know, it's just like we, we talk about the soldiers. I, I, I give to a couple of wounded warrior funds, my wife and I do, and we look at the soldiers that have passed in, in, in those heroes that have fought for us in, in, in the Middle East in the last uh, 10 years, but there are also a lot of them that come back without a leg or without an arm, etc. 
and the same parallel can be drawn with, uh, with airbags. The, there are a lot of people that would um, be paralyzed or wouldn't be able to walk or would have head injuries if not for the airbags. And Again, I think they're good. I'm just saying they would have been to the market later and probably better and more efficient than, than they are today. Okay, take one, one more. Thank you. One more question. I'm sorry? No, we'll, we'll make this the last question. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to ask you what, in your opinion, is, would be the most effective way to uh, institute a flat tax. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think that uh, you, you have a lot of um, challenges uh, with, with a flat tax, but I, but I would say to you that, um, you know, I, I've been playing around with uh, the fair tax. You know, if you want, uh, you get our monthly economic outlook, go back a couple of issues. There's a, an interesting piece on the... Uh, on the uh, fair tax, which is really a, a national sales tax. Uh, uh, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that and interested in it. And with the flat rate tax, um, you know, I think that um, as you look at it, uh, I, I would say to you everything that I've read is that, uh, you know, we do away with all exemptions and all deductions. And um, you, would, you would look at a rate uh, that would be progressive. Lower income people would, would not pay taxes uh, below $20,000. And then you'd put in place a flat rate tax of somewhere between 14 and 15 percent, and then we'd see, you know, like, and, and it's always interesting. I joke around with our with our priest in Midland, happened to be Catholic, and and I always say to him, well, then Father, you're really going to have to get out there and knock them dead, because a flat rate tax would take away any write-offs. You'd take away the write-off for a home mortgage, you'd take away the write-off for giving to your church, you'd take away uh, the write-off for giving to the United Way, etc. But, you know, the, the beauty of something like a flat rate tax is you, you do away with most tax attorneys. Uh, you would have dramatically fewer tax accountants. Uh, you'd, ha you'd have, you could wipe out most of the IRS be because there, there, there wouldn't be that many people that would uh, uh, be needing to look at uh, tax returns because basically it's here's what you paid, write us 14%, send it in. You know, tax form would be like two lines. And the opportunity cost and the administrative cost would be greatly reduced with a, uh, with, with a flat rate tax. Uh, and, and, and I'm very proud to say that my, my friend and our congressman from Midland, Dave Camp, who's head of the House Ways and Means Committee, he's looking at a lot of different options. And uh, he, he's one of the good guys in Washington. And he's going to champion uh, the most rational and logical uh, tax reform that, that we can get through. And he will be a patriot. He will be a person of courage and substance. The problem, gang, is not tax revenue, although I think a flat rate tax would lead to you know, a marginal increase in revenue. Our problem is spending. And we've got to cut the size and scope of government. Uh, and uh, right now, have a great lunch. And uh, we'll see you at 1.30 with Dr. Evelyn. Thank you.